Well, welcome everyone, uh, our students, alumni, to our uh, first iteration of Career Conversations with Architects um, around the globe. Today, we'll be featuring our architecture alumni in India in partnership with the India Global Gateways Office. My name is Aaron Klein. I am the Engineering Abroad Manager. Um, and so happy to be joined here today by my colleagues from um, the India Global Gateways Office, as well as some wonderful alumni. So before we get started, I just want to uh, share the stage with Vinod and Nikhil from our India Gateways Office, who are gonna share a little bit about what they do in their role. Wonderful, thank you, Aaron. Glad to be part of this conversation today. Uh, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for all of us to mutually connect and explore the possibilities. Uh, I am Nikhil Tambe. I currently lead the India Gateway. Uh, I'm based out of Mumbai, India. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good evening to those joining in from India. Uh, a little bit about India Gateway. This is an office which is one of the three global locations uh, that Ohio State's established. Uh, we started in 2012, so we've been on the ground ninth year now. Uh, the other two are in Shanghai and Sao Paulo. Uh, the offices really have allowed us an opportunity to uh, engage with our partners in the country over here. Uh, so we're talking about students, parents, prospective applicants uh, for Ohio State. We've been working closely with them for these past three to nine years. Uh, we've had an opportunity to engage with academia and industry partners as well as some of the government agencies uh, while working out from here for Ohio State. Uh, to think of it, you know, it, it basically comes down to some very common shared challenges uh, that I can see for both the countries, for US as well as India. I mean, these are challenges such as climate change, uh, infectious diseases, food and water security. It really boils down to, you know, how can we do these things better? And the, the only way to do this is to join minds, uh, to join our hands together. And that's that's where you know the office has really been helping uh, to carve out research or academic engagements. We also work with industry uh, in India. We've been prominently working in case you heard the names of Tata and Mahindra. Uh, these are two large conglomerates in India and they are our prominent partners. Uh, we've also established a frontier center for science and engineering with the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. Uh, so that has allowed us to get into research engagements. We see a lot of student exchange happening as a result of that. Uh, in a lot of activities that we do, uh, we typically have been working with a lot of our alumni uh, based in this country. Uh, the last count, we were about having 900 alumni in India. Uh, you are going to be meeting and talking to some of them today over here. Uh, but we are in active touch with 600 of them. And you know, so still a lot of uh, further ways to go for us. Uh, talking about the student engagements, we work a lot with prospective students. Uh, so in the stages when you know, students are exploring programs at Ohio State. And I mean, as you know, there's a lot of opportunity at Ohio State. So uh, the office really helps uh, students find out what's right for them, find out what's the right opportunities for them. Uh, we've had some of the folks on this uh, Zoom today helping us. Thanks, Atita, for you know a couple of months back we had you talking about you know how you went about your own programs. So uh, really, a lot of opportunities uh, are possible, and I think what's what's better than having an international career. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, make sure you have all great questions for some of the panelists here, and I hope to you know go along with some more food for thought for me and you know in terms of what we do. Thank you very much. Yeah, Vinod, you want to morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, and, uh, uh, my name is Vinod Pani, and uh, I am the alumni relations specialist uh, at the India Public Office in Mumbai. And I'm actually responsible for connecting alumni, but also alumni engagements that uh, are taking place in India. And uh, so I think this is a great opportunity. Thanks to Aaron and Leslie for uh, um, taking this opportunity to having our alumni in the education abroad uh, session. I'm hopeful that students will learn a lot uh, from our Newton alums uh, today in the session. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. Over to you, Aaron. 
Thank you, Vinod and Nikhil. And just a note for our students that are attending, there's a Q&A function on Zoom. So if you open that, you can type in any questions. I have a few queued up here that I'll start us off with, but please um, ask any questions that, that uh, come to you. Um, I'm going to sort of pose questions just generally to our alumni panel. Um, but if you have a specific question for an alumni, please address your question in the Q&A to that alum. Um, so to start it off, I would love to have our alumni introduce themselves, um, uh, say where they currently are um, in, in their career, their role, and also what degree or degrees they received from Ohio State. I'll go first. Hi, uh, my name is Atita Shetty, and uh, I graduated uh, in 2009 from OSU. Uh, I got my master's there. And currently, I'm based in Bombay, Mumbai. And I'm a practicing architect. And I also am a, a visiting faculty for an international design school. That's what I do. So I guess um, I'll go second. Um, my name is Kayan Mistry. Uh, I currently reside in Bombay or Mumbai, uh, as Atita said. Uh, I currently head uh, operations and new business for a luxury real estate company uh, called Esprava uh, that builds luxury holiday homes in uh, Goa, Kunur, Alibag, uh, and we're expand expanding to Sri Lanka as well. Um, I graduated, I did my undergraduate um, at Ohio State, um, and I got a Bachelor of Science of Architecture, um, and came back to India and been happy ever since, uh, but really have fond memories of OSU, for sure. I can go. go. Okay. Go Bye. ahead, go ahead. All right. Um, hi, um, I am currently working with HKS as their director of design. HKS is um, based out of Dallas, Texas, uh, and I've been with them for the last nine years now, uh, pretty much since I came back from my after my graduation from OSU. Um, I graduated from the Masters of City and Regional Planning program at OSU in 2009. Hi guys, I'm uh, Prashant uh, Prabhu from Bombay. I graduated in 2006, so I was in the 2004-2006 Masters in Architecture uh, program. Uh, I uh, did my undergraduate here in Bombay, then moved to uh, uh, Bombay, Mumbai, moved to uh, Columbus to do the Masters degree, then from there moved to New York to work for about five, six years with two boutique architecture firms in New York. Uh, moved back to Bombay in 2011, and since then, I've been teaching at various colleges as a, uh, as a visiting faculty, and also have my uh, small architecture practice uh, in uh, Bombay. So, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I think I was muted. Um, thank you all for, for that introduction. I think it's wonderful that we have such a wide variety of um, practicing uh, alumni, whether it be uh, visiting faculty, whether it be working in uh, real estate development, whether it be in design. Um, one of the things I think that's, that's unique about the, the architecture field is that there's so many ways that a student can go um, in, in their career trajectory. For all of you, um, some, of, some of you worked here domestically in the US and, and now you're abroad or maybe you went straight abroad after your degree here at Ohio State. How do you see sort of the, the field uh, changing and evolving from your time here in the US to where you are now in your career abroad? I think uh, one of the changes that I have noticed is like the, the gap is being bridged, you know, at many levels, like including the style of architecture to the materials being used. Like, uh, you know, that there was a wide spectrum earlier where like both were at the opposite ends. 
but now like people are moving towards the you know common ground so that is what i notice like technologically material wise design style all these factors are actually coming together but it will take time i think that's what i noticed i think i think also there's there's an evolution of regulatory norms uh, and and on a global stage uh, is very different to uh, an indian context um, i think a lot of times when you design in america there are very clear boundaries and lines within which you design a structure um i think in india primarily there, there is a sense of interpretation and the lines are blurred uh, which also at times limits design and at times um, enhances design uh, but definitely there's a new trend that's coming out where you're going back to certain original construction techniques that have been found in india as well um, and on a more boutique level uh, that's something that is being explored uh, obviously in large metropolises and cities that's not possible but in the hinterlands where development is happening in second and third tier cities uh there there is this new emergence of sustainable practices that uh, uh people are following or architects are following and clients are requesting as well uh and now with covid and work from home where you no longer have to be stuck to a city uh, and you can work work remotely that's an entire new trend uh, that is coming in where people with great connectivity and internet you can work from where you want Uh, and the indian mindset and the business mindset is changing um abroad it's very easy for uh, people to have ownership of, of their work uh, and there's trust uh, in india there hasn't been that trust with an indian workforce uh because if you think they're sitting at home they're not doing work uh, and now that trust because of covid is coming where companies are evolving are working with their employees sitting at home uh and and that they understand that there's a huge cost saving for a capex uh, perspective right i don't need a 6000 square feet office i can operate out of a 1000 square feet satellite office right or i don't need an office uh and if i do need to meet i can meet in a public space uh so so those are the trends that we're now at least seeing and have evolved in the last 5 um, 6 months that we're facing of covid um if i may add uh, i feel like at least in the last 10 years since we graduated and um the traditionally i if i may say so i don't think india is viewed as a hub for design talent or was viewed as a hub for design talent we've always had a challenge in um conveying this message to the world that we are very much we have the talent and we ha- we are very much capable of designing uh to uh, world standards uh, and that was definitely a challenge in changing that perception because uh, when i when i came back to india that was the time that was around the time that all the multinationals all the all the big names were starting to um kind of step foot in india and the general perception was that uh, well india would be great to be used as a um, a back office if i may say so where you could like they're great at technical details but definitely don't bring them definitely not at like visualizing a, a big concept but i feel like that at the time that multinationals were coming back so was a lot of talent headed back home for instance a lot of us right um so it is very the the kind of resumes we got may, say in 2009 to what we actually get really quality designers um for hire now like you can easily find what you're looking for within uh, india with like people with really a great resume and great experience uh, in design so i think that's definitely changed um for us in a, that's a definitely a good thing i think i'm i think i'm i'm the oldest in this this bunch of people i think i'll 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 go back to times when when india there was no design in india the idea of design was did not exist right in the early 90s no one knew what an architect was no one knew what a designer was no i think that perception has slowly changed over time 
uh, entering 2000s, we were always looking westward. You were looking outwards to find designers, to find ideas, to find people who would come and design in India. I think that perception is slowly changing. Now there are a lot of good design firms that practice out of India, practice out of cities that are not only metro cities, like whether it's Bangalore, Chennai, uh, uh, Bombay, Calcutta. There are also a lot, like like uh, Payan mentioned, there are a lot of small firms that are doing fantastic work all over smaller towns in India. So, so design is now sort of percolated right down to even smaller towns where people are aware of what design means. In the early 90s, early 2000s, people really didn't know uh, what you did as an architect, right? When you said you were an architect, people did not, they said, okay, what does an architect do? And they would, and this is a joke, but they would call us architecture and not architects. You know, so you are an architecture, that's what they would call us. And now they understand that there is someone such as an architect, what his role is in the design or his or her role is in the design fraternity. What do they do? What is, what is, uh, uh, their, what, what, what are they, the job profiles, they understand all that. And at the same time, I think design has now become something that's an accepted norm and people are aware. I think that has been the biggest change in the since the start of the millennium to now, you know, since the start of 2000s to now, I think that has been the biggest change and awareness of what an architect does. You know, so I think that's the biggest change I've seen in India, you know, uh, and people now are now, now being an architect is fancy. You know, most heroes in films are architects because they live this fancy lifestyle and they have this fancy, but none of it is true. You know, but an architect is looked at as, as that guy who's like, you know, who's got a fancy lifestyle, great profile, is, is, is rich, well off, earns a lot of money, all of it is fake. But that, that's, the, that's the profile have, that people have, you know, that, that's the person people are. So a lot of people now want to become architects. Earlier, a lot of students wanted to become doctors, engineers, uh, you know, jobs that were safe. Now, I think a lot of them are moving towards design, architecture, because they realize that that, that that profession also exists. So that, I think, has been a sea change in the perception of the profession within, within the country. And Can not I only add... in the metro. Sorry. Sorry. Just, and I, I exactly what Prashant said, I feel like um, we are now entering the third phase wherein design is almost with the advent of live space and you know it's become reachable right. for the common man it's almost coming to the third it, it's, it's evolved to become a commodity now even in, in india so i think yeah, it's things are really changing and people are understanding and appreciating and wanting good design for themselves as well which the idea never existed before so i think in keeping with the times you could say design has reached community transmission you know, we've become, there's design which is now starting to sort of reach each and every person in India, and there's an awareness about that. Definitely, and I, and I think it's the entire, as Nikita said, it's the entire ecosystem that is evolved, right? So be it with a live space, be it with a WeWork, where you have these uh, sort of uh, co-working spaces where creative people come together uh, to uh, idea, right, and to create uh, together. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an architect uh, to design something now. You can be a product designer, you could be an interior person, you could be a stylist, but you collaborate together and cohesively come together and evolve into something, uh, which is also a really interesting uh, spectrum. Uh, but then talking from a niche perspective, uh, when, when you talk about the ultra high end luxury space, um, a lot of uh, people now want that entire ecosystem uh, and collective package as well. Uh, so they don't want to get into how you get it done, but they want to basically be uh, handheld through purchase the land, build the home, you design it for me, you get my input, and you take care of that entire headache, which is architecture, right? Uh, or interior design or execution. Uh, and they want that ready product. Um, so they want to move into that ready space where everything is detailed out, everything is done and ready for them. Uh, and that's also a new changing trend where originally you would leave it to the architect to do. Uh, but now with the onset of Pinterest, now with the onset of all these fantastic online spaces, uh, they become Google architects, right? Uh, and they say, this is what I want. Uh, and then it's up to the architect to interpret what their wishes and wants are. And 
at times maybe give them exactly what they want or at times put their own twist and flair to it, um, which is something that's interesting as well. So I, I'm, there's another very interesting uh, phenomenon I've been observing the last seven, eight years. There's a certain notion of Indianness that's coming back. You know, there's a certain notion of what does it mean to be Indian? How does what is it? What is Indian design? You know, whether it's in fashion, product, uh, whether it's in architecture, whether it's in interiors, there's a certain uh, sense of what does it mean to be Indian in design? And we're sort of looking backwards in a way to go forwards now. You know, we are all trying to tap into uh, what what does it mean to be Indian, and how does it play out into all fields of design? So that's another very interesting uh, sort of phenomenon, which I'm sure uh, Fan is also seeing in a lot of uh, you know probably requirements for homes that that come in. So I think it's a it's, it's, a, it's a really also the general uh, sorry. Go on. You were saying sorry. So no, no, go on, Adira, general sorry. perception has been that uh, CD what you mentioned, the Indianness of uh, design, it has always been perceived as more, how do I say it, ornamental and more rural and more indigenous, you know, specific to a certain uh, land. But uh, now, actually, if you come to India, you will see that a lot of westernization has been going on for many years now. So uh, what was, uh, how do you say it, normal for us, uh, is premium for uh, people in the West and what's premium for them is normal for us, you know? Yeah, so like turmeric. Vice versa, the roles have been reversed. Yeah, even materials like uh, what's common for uh, say US is constructing in wood. Wood is premium, like high cost material in India. It's not easily available. It cannot suffice the population that we have. So it's premium for us and it's like, you know, very generic for the US. And if you ask for brickwork, for example, it needs a lot of detailed manual labor. So it's expensive for the US. So it's premium for them. For us, even our toilet walls are sometimes made out of brickwork. So it's that different, which is getting bridged now. I think that's an interesting point Atita brought up about, about labor. I mean, the, the value of labor, the value of uh, construction workers, I mean, in the, in the West, uh, specifically in the US, there's a certain uh, value that's attached to a construction worker. Here, it is, it, there, there's absolutely no value. People, they, you have skilled and unskilled labor, and they are paid accordingly, they're paying pay, they're, they're, they're daily wage. So, and the, I think the, the basic root is population. We have such a large population that we can afford to have skilled, unskilled labor. We can, we can do sites with, I mean, in, this would never work in the US. You know, having something like that, where you don't know whether a worker will turn up the next day. You know, it, it's things like that. So it's, it's, it's a very different market. It's a very different environment. It's a very different uh, uh, situation. Very unpredictable. I wanted to uh, go back to something that, that Kyan had mentioned about sustainable practices. And I think that's something that we're seeing a lot, uh, obviously here in the US and, and certainly abroad, but sometimes here in the US, we look to uh, other countries around the world at, at what is what they are doing, because oftentimes they're sort of on the forefront of sustainability before it comes to the US. Kyan, could you talk a little bit more about sort of the sustainable practices that you're seeing, especially in, in your real estate development? And then I'd be curious with sure. the others on the panel um, think of that so, as well. So I think one of our, the, 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 the startup that I work for, one of our fundamental um, but, uh, foundations primarily is wherever we build in a location, we are true to that location's local indigenous look and feel. Right? Uh, so one of the locations we work in is Goa. Goa was originally a Portuguese city. Uh, so it's this go and portuguese style of architecture that we follow and we build our homes that way so uh, i think site context is really important for us when we build in kunur in the nilgiris for instance uh, those used to be old english tea plantations so you have british colonial colonial architecture that we follow over there so there's certain original techniques uh, be it with load bearing structures that we follow uh, be it with lime plaster that we use in our go and homes which naturally uh, are easy to maintain uh, and at the same time keep the home cool uh, 
uh, because it's a natural uh, insulator. Thick walls of load-bearing walls automatically cool the house. So you save on tonnage of ACs, right? Uh, you don't need to have one ton, two tons. You can do it in you know, a quarter of that or half that. Um, those are going, and I think as uh, Prashant said, you're going back to your original roots of design, right? And you're going back to your original principles of design, which is, and if you go to Indian principles of design and architecture, it's Vastu Shastra, right? Uh, it's the original concept of uh, where you need to place certain rooms bases the elements uh, that react around you. Uh, so in certain places where uh, you, in, at least in Maharashtra uh, and Goa, et cetera, you have Southwest rains, which are really heavy. So you would always have uh, larger awnings and porches on uh, the, the Southwest side to ensure protection of, of the house, uh, et cetera. Um, certain locations that they choose uh, bases the energy of the earth and the soil, right? Uh, now, yes, can you measure these sort of things? You can't. But, but there are enough scientific tests that are done that can prove that X, Y, Z happens um, and X, Y, Z doesn't. Uh, so I think vast ordinarily is basic fundamental logic of how does wind react with the structure? How does the heat react with the structure? How does uh, rain react with the structure and your external elements impact the internal elements? Um, I think from one level, there's, there's that ancient practice that we follow. And as architects in India, we, I would say 50% of us uh, follow it and believe it and think it's great. The other 50% of us just break our heads because when you have a client who's extremely particular about it, Vastu doesn't work for a high rise structure, right? You're going to have somebody who's not in a Vastu compliant plan. And the common person doesn't understand that uh, because Vastu at the end of the day was for a ground floor structure, right? That's the original content. Uh, but when you talk about materiality, when you talk about um, uh, screening technologies that you do use uh, using local uh, material. I mean, I know in the West uh, you do have your 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 sustainability councils, etc. Uh, and in India we do have the same. Uh, it is a bit difficult uh, to follow international sustainability practices which are not uh, relevant to India. Uh, so when you have to bring material in from a certain radius from your site. Uh, when you build remote areas, it's not practical or possible, right? Uh, but in an um, urban setting, it may be possible. Uh, so there are a lot of adjustments that need to happen. And I think India as a whole needs to create their own version of what are our sustainable standards. Um, and the government itself has to enforce these norms as well. Because if you give businesses some sort of uh, tax benefits or write-offs, uh, you will then have you will have corporates who then drive and push uh, for sustain more sustainable practices to come in. Uh, when you work with MNCs and international companies, they have their code of ethics and standards from the West, which is why in India they follow the same standards. So an office of Citibank in New York is exactly the same way as an office of Citibank in Bombay. For um, and I think until government intervention comes in, your average real estate builder, unless you're silly like us and we want to stick to our original roots, uh, you're not going to spend that extra one rupee, hundred rupee, thousand rupee, because at the end of the day, profits is everything, right? You're making or breaking it as a startup. Uh, so that's that's. My also, idea. what I uh, I believe uh, somewhere I would beg to differ because uh, what you're saying, Kaya, now actually applies to very limited places, uh, parts of India, actually. Uh, say Goa is obviously not as densely populated as the rest of the country. Um, so I think you can still implement a lot of the previous traditional conventional practices. But uh, what I'm seeing is a very steep decline in sustainable design practices in cities because our traditional architecture was always based on climate, based on, you know, uh, local materials. It was always just about that. Like if you would go to say Rajasthan, you will, you will find houses only made of sandstone and, you know, whatever sand mortar or whatever. But now if you go to see everywhere, it's like concrete, concrete, concrete. In cities, Bombay is so hot. You'll still find so many glass structures and, and then obviously you switch on AC to keep yourself cool. The natural methods of ventilation that were being used uh, traditionally, how to ventilate a, you know, a room or how to ventilate a house, um, that 
doesn't happen anymore. Each house has one window facing one side. So there is like the wind comes in from the same side and has to get out of probably the doors if you keep them open. So it's really not that sustainable anymore. You know, that's what I feel. It used to be, but not anymore. I completely agree. In a city, it's very difficult. You have space constraints. Uh, and then you're trying to maximize that space constraint in India uh, on that footprint. Uh, so you don't have the luxury of being able to spread out. You automatically go up vertically. I completely agree with you. And uh, actually, uh, international students like for, for India, like people outside of India, say from the West mostly, uh, one advantage for them to come and visit Asian countries, a lot of Asian countries, if, if I may say so, would be to actually explore and study their original old architecture. You know, if they get a chance and opportunity to study that, I think uh, a lot of these sustainable uh, small, small elements of a house even can be implemented in their designs back home, you know. So I think uh, that would be nice instead of putting like, you know, really high-end solar panels, which will cost more than the entire construction of the building, you know? It would rather be, you know, helpful if they can learn these small things from these regions. I, I think uh, sustainability is a word made by the West. I don't think there's a word for sustainability in Indian, any Indian language. We've always right. been sustainable. We've always been That's sustainable. True. They've yeah. always been a when you have a when you have a landmass that holds probably four times the population of America, right? We are a country of probably 1.3 billion people. You learn to be sustainable right from the from birth, right? Because we have villages that survive on rainfall for 10 days a year. We have villages that survive on resources that are available. That there's not a speck of food available anywhere for miles. So they learn to live with the land. They learn to live with the environment. They learn to live in the environment they're they brought up in. Sustainability is a bad word the West has introduced in India and in the East. And that is something that we are trying to follow uh, norms that are set by the West, which are made for, for, for the culture of the West, which is made for the climate of the West, which is made for uh, the, the, the population of the West. That is the mistake we are doing. We are always following international norms. We don't have our own norms. We don't have our own, but we've always been sustainable. So if we go back to the, the roots of what, how we live, we don't need to be sustainable. We always were, we always recycled. I remember and the, the, the funny thing is you go out trying to find something when it's been at home all the while, you know, we've always recycled at home. We've always been extremely careful about how we use uh, materials. We have always been very careful about not overspending or not being over, uh, you know, uh, uh, callous with our resources. So we've always been that. So I think if you just look inwards and try to look at how you can change your own lifestyle, right, or change the way you live, I think that small change will go for, and if you can try and convince your clients to live like that, right, and if you can try and pass this on, I think that's the best way to be sustainable. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm a lead uh, accredited professional in the US. And I was studying for lead. I found some of those some of those uh, suggestions were so stupid. I'm sorry, but they were just so they they were absolutely pointless, you know. And those are things that we've always followed in our culture. So it's you really don't need to look outwards. You need to look inwards. You need to figure out what is it that makes your own environment sustainable, and then everything else will work or follow in in suit. So I I don't think uh, sustainability is something that needs to be you know taught. It just needs to be, uh, I think, made. Uh, people need to be made aware of it. That's it. Yeah, I I remember we have had this uh, in our previous uh, uh, alumni Prashant. meet. We were talking about the same thing. Um, like Prashant said, I also got my well certification um, about last year, and. Uh, when um, I was trying to actually apply those two projects in India, we realized that the cost of doing that would come to around one crore, which is a huge cost to add to a project that just to simply apply common sense. 
uh, so instead of actually chasing certifications it the the goal should be to be able to imbibe what's already there what's the indigenous local knowledge that got lost along the way somewhere uh, while we were trying for our buildings to look more like buildings in the west uh, i feel like it's like a we've got ourselves into first creating a problem and then solving it uh, you know uh, a lot Paying of the certification Paying a lot of money to someone to solve money it. Money to solve it, exactly. Yeah. So, I, I, I completely agree. It's time for us to look inwards. I feel like the cultural uh, shift has already started, where wherein I feel like Indians have started taking more pride in who they are and what they have started to question what their identity is in the world instead of just um, what their what what it means on a global platform. uh i feel like it's the shift started about 5 years ago and it's not just limited to design it's actually you see it in our movies and you see it um you see it in everything like if if you see most of our movies over the last few years have actually been about small town india and that says something that's like about us taking more pride in who we really are so Absolutely. i think eventually yeah, yeah. so i feel uh, i personally feel that uh, I, a lot of students uh, from osu or anywhere else in the us should actually you know try and get some years of experience anywhere in asia if possible because uh, what that will do is you know from this uh, very generic kind of you know style of designing very strip mall uh, kind of experience that they will get there you know i think this will force them to firstly work in a smaller space probably even spaces smaller than their bedrooms you know if i may say so uh they because there's a lot of space in the us uh, and if a lot of places in the west i if i may say so and india is like congested like every part of india is like times square so you can understand the density and the space available is very less so we are so used to working with smaller spaces and making the most out of you know really small spaces so i think that is one aspect that the students uh, from the us will learn if they come and work in asia anywhere in asia i'm sure and uh, that will obviously force them to work within the budgets of asia because there's a huge difference between the budget of a building in the us versus say in india or pakistan or even maybe china you know like the budgets might be very very different so uh, being able to work in a large plot is very easy but the moment you are forced to work on a very small plot with double the requirement of that large plot you know you will learn to actually design what is really designing you know you actually learn that and understand how you can manage so many things within such a small space and you know create amazing uh, designs out of that i think that is one of the biggest reasons students should explore uh, you know coming out to the east and learning for a few years at least if if nothing else i i think atita you bring up a very valid point and and that's something that osu needs to really drive on which is adaptability right why are we successful today in india is because of our ability to adapt uh and in adapt on multiple levels right uh today norms say x tomorrow the governmental regulations may change and say y right so we design keeping future proof in mind uh, to a certain extent uh and and also as as human beings and as architects uh you have to learn to adapt the client may like it today may hate it tomorrow uh and i think that's one of the things in our architectural critiques right uh you would spend weeks and weeks and weeks and we had a uh, the, the the lovely system of 10 weeks uh, which i believe now is 6 weeks so we had uh, quarter systems or the semester systems uh but in that 10 week time period you could have worked your butt off for 9 weeks and in the last final week your professor just destroys you and says that's absolutely terrible right rework it and in that last 5 days 6 days 7 days Uh, you would have to perform a miracle right and that they architecture school and uh, prepares you 
they, they, I think it's like Navy SEALs, right? They break you down uh, and, and then they build you up. So no matter what you face in the real world, it's nothing compared to architecture school, right? Because you're so conditioned to handle rejection. I know this may sound negative, uh, but it's also a positive aspect, right? No amount of a client telling me, I don't like your design affects me. No amount of a client changing his mind. Yes, fi from a financial and business perspective, there's an, there's an element of it. Uh, but what it teaches me is con forever to just continuously sidestep, sidestep, sidestep. Straight's not working, step to the left. Left's not working, step to the right. And that is a skill set of an international uh, architect or even an OSU student uh, working in these disorganized, chaotic um, countries uh, is something that really will hold them in good stead because then they really understand the true value of things and they're able to work far more efficient uh, whenever they go back to, to the West or if they continue to practice in the East. Uh, they understand how to work a system uh, and at the end of the day, get the end goal done. Uh, and that's an important skill set. I think adaptability is key if you work in well. Also, um, just to add to that, you know, like the sense of designing, uh, for example, let me just uh, say a two, two bedroom house or apartment in the US I think the occupants would be two or three, right? But a house, a two bedroom house in Mumbai, for example, or Delhi, the occupants would start from four and range up to six or eight. So when you're given a design brief, uh, say in the US, you would have to design with the uh, perspective of maybe two people. You know, you're fitting the house with two people, but here the same space, probably lesser space, uh, but the same configuration, say a two-bedroom two house or a three-bedroom apartment, you're fitting in for, say, eight to ten people sometimes. And you have to focus on all of their needs, all of their requirements. And that is a real design challenge that, you know, that actually, uh, how do I say it? Uh, it forces you to elevate your standards, elevate your levels, and make sure that everything, almost everything, has been provided for. Also a lot of uh, opportunity, I would say for customization, like customizing in the US, what I've noticed everything is uh, IKEA or, you know, standard, you go to Home Depot, you figure out uh, cabinet doors and, you know, there are fixed sizes for everything. Uh, in India, it's the opposite. There is no fixed size for anything. I can have one cabinet, which is 17 inches. I can have one cabinet, which is five inches one which is four inches and I have the uh, labor to actually execute that. So uh, while that can be chaotic for uh, the people who are working, the contractors who are working on those designs, but they are so used to it that it's very easily done. But also to be able to design and detail a house, a building or an office to that level of detail, it's like you decide where your lines are going you don't uh, uh, check out IKEA website for sizes and that doesn't define your, uh, you know, lines. You design and it gets done. So that is a really, really big advantage of working. I think at least in India, that's the case. China is mostly modular, obviously. Um, I think even Pakistan would be like India, you know, similar lines. So a lot of customization is possible here. And that is premium for the U.S. So I think just come over and just, you know, enjoy this. <laughs> I, I think, Atita, also the no point is... There's no word Indian language either. Sorry? There's no word for design in any Indian language. It's so called design, God. Yeah, it's called <laughs> Yeah, anyone can just call a carpenter and tell them, okay, I want five shelves here and the five shelves will be done. Okay, I want four here, then four will be adjusted in the same place. What is interesting is I'm just thinking about it is, is there's always been the perception that architecture in the West is intellectual, right? And architecture in the East is always about uh, beauty and dumbness, right? Uh, architecture in the West is all about, you know, these proportions and the golden ratio and Kabuzia went to, the, to, to, the, to Europe to study architecture, but nobody ever came to India. I mean, India has a culture that's probably 5,000 years old. We've been building far earlier than what uh, the West ever even learned to build. 
but nobody comes here to look at how things were done earlier you know so it, it it's always like the the west has always looked at the east or at at and when i say east i mean india china all the southeast asian countries as as a uh, places with with culture that does not really matter i think that has to change now because those cultures have a lot to teach the west and those cultures have a lot of history that the west can really learn from so i think students like like atita and tan were saying they really need to pick up their bags come and live in the east come and live and travel in the east and understand what it means to live in a really hot humid climate where it rains five months a year and how do people live lives in places that are smaller than most homes in the us and and that really will change the way you think as a designer that will really change the way you 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 look at the world you know like when i was in the, when i was in, in at ohio state in columbus uh there only two of us as indians right and and uh, it's very interesting that none of the other students had stepped out of columbus none of the other american students had stepped out of columbus and we were thinking of going to new york to get a job and most of them would be like what you guys are going to new york we're going to do a job in columbus i said why would you do that i mean this is a chance for you to step out of your comfort zone i think that that comfort zone needs to be uh you know you need to get out of the comfort zone so it's very important that you travel you see the world you form an opinion and you you are well rounded and i think that's something that architecture school you should i think practice also prashant think, what you mentioned uh you know it's, it's same all over for example a house say in brooklyn you know which is a little bit spaced out than manhattan uh the house would be very similar to anywhere in uh, louisiana or you know baton rouge uh, new orleans anywhere else you know, the houses are the same even though even though baton rouge louisiana new orleans like the whole state basically is so prone to hurricanes but still the houses are still there are there, there's not a single house where you'll see stilts like how in japan you know they have some houses on stilts to just to whatever you know the uh, it could be uh, tsunami yeah, yeah, yeah. the earlier the earlier houses the earlier houses in louisiana were actually built for the weather they were built for a hot humid yeah, climate but now they are not they're all on the not. on the ground how they are not well, there's no difference McDonald's. like everybody design the same be, mcdonald all over the world yeah absolutely you can be in any part of the us you can be in california uh, you know feeling hot but the house will be the same so there is no difference for the heat in california but not versus in india. A, you know the cold in brooklyn you know the mcdonald's in india not a single mcdonald's is the same you get different the the, the best part is the west has to <laughs> adopt so the east you know when you you come to mcdonald's in india you will get a different menu at every mcdonald's in every state of india <laughs> that because that's yes. the power of population you know when you it's have customized so people, everything is customized customized you have to because if you you eventually it's capitalism it's very interesting you know you you have to change you have to adapt like like ian was saying and and that that's a wonderful uh, sort of uh, uh, quality to have to be able to adapt and we we grew up with that what i do think the east lacks uh, and needs to catch up on is how to market themselves i think we yes. are very poor marketers we have so much to market and we we talk very little about ourselves and that i feel like west has done so well and that's something that we really need to learn uh, even if you go travel as a tourist you see how really really inconsequential things are marketed so well and when you actually go through the experience you're like really did i just pay with so much money to do that like it i was expecting more from this experience and there is even just in in terms of tourism right like there is i feel like our campaigns are are very underwhelming and in general our marketing of Uh, how to attract talent and how to have people come and witness what we have i i think we haven't done a great job uh, of marketing that marketing and packaging marketing and packaging yeah that we Absolutely. definitely can learn has nailed that how do you market and package even the most banal thing is is so well done aaron we are not yeah, attacking i know there, 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 there are about six indians and only one of you we are not attacking you but we just we just we just here pointing out things that i think could be useful to the students 
And, and I, I appreciate that so much because I think, you know, in, in, in my role and in my colleagues' role here at Ohio State, we, we preach having a global perspective on things, getting outside of their comfort zone. Um, and I think it's so impactful for them to hear that from professionals who are working in the field, that this is something that really is, is, is a requisite to enter whatever profession they choose, whether it be architecture, whether we're talking about business or healthcare, to have that global perspective, um, you know, that, that's so, that's at the center of what we do here at OIA. So I really appreciate the fact that um, each and every one of you sort of hit on that necessity. And I guess that sort of leads me in to my next question, because we had a, a question submitted from one of our students talking about recommendations on finding those opportunities. Atita and Prashant, you talked about, you know, come to the to uh, to the Asian countries, come to India, and, and certainly to, to give a plug for education abroad at Ohio State, we have uh, programs, we have exchange programs, we have internships and, and research opportunities for students here within OSU. But for all of you, you, you've taken your career abroad. What advice or recommendations would you give to students that are sitting here saying, yep, in two or three years, I wanna work in India. How can they practically do that? Okay, let me uh, just say that if if they are prepared to work for much, much lower wages, that's the first mindset that they need to have because the pay scales in US is where, even for an intern for that matter, is very different than what is you know given in India, for example. So that is the first thing that they need to identify for themselves that if they are financially sound and if they don't mind taking that, you know, one, two years, uh, you know, to get a rich experience, if they don't mind for going, you know, the the money aspect of it, then I think that that's when they should decide to come. Uh, also, if they do come, uh, India is not as, uh, how do you say, there's, there are not too many channels. If you like a firm, if you just go online, if you see some, you know, nice visuals, uh, especially smaller firms, it's very easy you can easily approach them. It's very easy to actually just shoot an email and uh, more often than not, you will get a response as long as you make sure that you convey that you're not expecting American wages in India. So that's, I think that would be the only, uh, you know, point of, uh, you know, breaking point for that matter if you don't get the opportunity. And there are people who have done that successfully from the program. I remember Addison Goodell from, uh, I think, Atita, he was he your batch. He was my, he, my partner, yes. Yeah, so I, I know that he spent a considerable amount of time working for Charles Korea, I want to say. What, was he working for Charles Korea or BV Doshi? No, he was, a, he was a small firm in Ahmedabad, if I remember right. It wasn't, yeah, any it wasn't Charles it, Korea. Okay. Mm -hmm. it was but a small he did come in. Firm. Okay. But he did, um, he, I think he did spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, doing that. And I, at that point, I thought it was, it was quite brave of him to uh, venture. But if you think about it, we did the exact same thing, right? Like we went from our country and went ahead, got our education and worked in a different, it's, it's no, about... So but for us, it's an upgrade. For them, it's sort of a downgrade as far as the finances are concerned. Nothing else, it, it, but just the finances. I think, I think it's, you know? it's the experience as well, right? It's I how you package that. it, right? I think that that's yeah. exactly what you guys are talking about. We, the point is, it's not a downgrade or an upgrade. It's a phenomenal experience, right? Why did no, we... Just on the love, financial... Just on the even on the financial, it's it's growth, it's learning, right? Uh, I don't see earning. When you do a free internship, uh, you're going there... Uh, you may yeah. get somebody's copy, but you're gaining a skill set that you may not have been exposed to earning a thousand dollars a day, right? Uh, right? And I think that is the value that we have to pitch and Absolutely. put a put ahead. And and where Aaron to answer your question, I think you need to leverage your network and the Bakai network in India, right? Uh, I think you guys are the first point of contact where you then reach out to the alumni or you reach out to us and maybe we. We may have opportunities or we may know people who have opportunities as well, right? So it's not only restricted to uh, OSU, uh, but it's also uh, networking amongst the various American alumni or Canadian alumni, or Australian alumni 
uh, associations in India, right? Uh, I think if the alumni associations network themselves, then you've covered the whole world uh, and you've covered every single network that's out there. Um, and I think that is really key that letting, I know in, when I was at OSU, I can't remember even thinking about opportunities in India, right? Uh, that OSU spoke about. Uh, they may have been there and I may not have been involved, but uh, at least in the architecture world, uh, I knew there was Jackie Gargas who had a phenomenal, uh, it, the, the European tour that you got to see, right? In a span of 30 days, uh, you saw architecture worth 5,000 years worth of architecture, right? Um, which, which was incredible. And that really, according to me, if there was one advice I would give any student to do, uh, especially if you're in Ohio State uh, and, it, and if you've never left your hometown, uh, which is what my roommate Adam uh, never left Ohio, never left Waynesburg till he went to Ohio State, and Waynesburg was a one signal and a half town. Um, the point was that uh, go on these architecture study abroads. Uh, I understand the West does have uh, beautiful architecture and history. I think Prashant has brought up a very valid, and Antita has brought up a very valid point that the East as well have beautiful history as well, beautiful technologies as well, beautiful sustainable practices that nobody has packaged and put together uh, and pitched uh, to the West. Uh, so talking about something as silly as uh, rainwater harvesting, right, which is everybody's go-to word that everybody's using because water is going to become a very scarce commodity. Uh, a, a small village in Gujarat called Baruch has a tanka system, which is the original rainwater harvesting system, which is over 800 or 1,000 years old. Uh, and they've been doing it and they were able to collect water that would sustain a family for eight and nine and 10 months of the year. Uh, and they used traditional techniques where they didn't need a fridge and because it was dug down deep, the water came out cold. So they had cold water before ice was invented uh, when the British brought ice in India, right? Or whenever they, that happened. Uh, the, the point is that as a global university, uh, it's your responsibility with our assistance to build this narrative and to package this product where India isn't about slumdog millionaire and people living in slums and poor people and starving people and the generic images that we uh, share across the world. It is about young professionals. It is about um, changing that narrative and upgrading that narrative. Uh, and as, as Nikita also said, it's about saying that India is a design destination now, right? So five years ago or 10 years ago, everybody in their world was saying Singapore, Singapore, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, the best designers are all there. And all your Indian builders and real estate people rushed off to that continent. Uh, now, a lot of Indian builders, et cetera, are saying that uh, we would get these fantastic designs and then they would hire an Indian architecture practice to decipher it and make it India sized, right? Uh, and convert those droids. Uh, and now they're just saying, why would we even go there? Because you have Indian companies that can do it as well, right? Uh, so you do have uh, international practices um, or at least practices that are developing international designs uh, in India. And that really is exciting to see. And boutique firms. Feel free to reach out to the India Gateway as a resource, you know, as you are exploring opportunities. Just like Kayan and Atita are saying. Uh, so, Aaron, uh, what you can do is ask the uh, the students or whoever is interested. They can always reach out to alumni in India. They can at least, Absolutely. what they can do is ask for a list of good boutique firms where they can act, depending on what their preference is. If they want, uh, you know, some larger exposure, they can ask for firms of that sort and they can always ask for, you know, uh, different kinds of firms. So at least they'll get a recommendation of firms that they can, you know, approach. And That's LinkedIn. Nice. I think LinkedIn is a fantastic platform where uh, you can connect with professionals. Yes. Right? Uh, but to and, narrow and, it down a little bit, you know, get yeah, first hand uh, rep references, yeah. I think that would really help for the, for the students. Yeah. And if not all, uh, all architecture firms are equal, right? Like it, yeah. it, it's very important to identify the kind of firm you would like to work in. Um, where do you see yourself fitting in? I think that's the most important question to ask because you have an entire array of, um, of design firms uh, to choose from, but you have to decide whether you'd like to be part of a large firm doing 
um, being in charge of something small in a larger firm? Or would you like to have like the whole gamut of experience working for a smaller boutique firm that where you get to do everything because uh, th that's that's the way it is. So just from that perspective, I think like everyone else said, it's you could get that, you can get that short list for, from somebody in the uh, alumni network because we've been here for a long time we know what to look for i mean we can make the we we can match make you in a way with the sort of experience you're looking for versus what's available in the market right now absolutely and i think that's why we're so fortunate to have nikhil and vinod uh, and the global reach that ohio state has that we have access to these gateway offices that we can have this collaboration for our students and, and, and for their, their future careers. I'm sorry, Prashant, I didn't mean to no, no, interrupt you. Go no, ahead. No. I just want to say two things. One is, I think, going back to your earlier question of what, what does it need to work? Uh, what do you need to work uh, abroad? I want is an open mind, you know, keep an open mind and be ready for any experience that comes your way. Uh, and don't form an opinion before you're here. You know, because there is a lot of opinion that's already been formed about what life is in India or in cities. Keep an open mind, come with an open mind. Uh, and secondly, I, I would say never intern for free. Never yes. work in an internship for free, ever. Whether it's in Anywhere India, whether it's in Japan, wherever. Because what that does is that brings down the, 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 the internships that other possibilities that other students could get, you know, because then once you work for free, they, they're generally expected to work for free. And that's probably something that's going on in all offices. I, I, I understand that uh, working in a very good office is, is, is a great thing to have in your resume. But at the same time, you're allowing yourself to be exploited by working for free in, as an intern in, in an office. So never work for free and keep an open mind. That's one thing I would. Uh, and if you are going to work for wages that are lower than what you are uh, expected to earn, try to figure out what else can you get out of it. Right, in terms of experience, in terms of travel, in terms of uh, uh, culture, what you can get out of that, right? Sorry. Adam, there's one thing. If you're going to ask, this is something we discussed last time. If you're going to ask four architects to answer a question, you're never going to get the right answer and you're never going to get a straightforward answer. You're always going to get an answer that's that never answers the question. That's God's honest truth. Yes, Absolutely. It, it, that's, that's just the way it works. I think it's well, the, I, the, uh, the jury, the architecture jury has trained us to, to do that. Never <laughs> say something, but friends. never really answer the question. <laughs> Every conversation is a discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it tends to get too free -willing. Sorry, sorry, Aaron. No, you're fine. You're fine. Well, I do want to be respectful of, of, of your time and, and our students' time as well. But just to end it, and, and Prashant, you sort of started talking about you know, the one thing is having an open mind. What sort of lasting piece of advice would you give students where, you know, if they're sitting here on campus, they still maybe have two or three years before they graduate, or maybe they're even graduating this year. What sort of advice do you have for practical things that they can do before they graduate to prepare themselves for an international career? I think first is uh, start looking at work that you're really interested in. Right. First, try and figuring, try and figure out where your interests lie. What kind of work would you like to do? What kind of uh, uh, place would you like to work in? Right. It's it's the same way how we apply for colleges abroad. Right. We want to be in a city. We know we want a college at a certain program. We we know where what what tuition we can afford. Those kind of things. So in a way, start making a short list. This is the kind of work I like to do. This is the kind of city I would like to live in. This is the kind of place that I would like to explore and then start looking up, up about that, you know, start looking up at other firms that do that kind of work and already have a short list of what say 15, 20, 25 firms, reach out to them, uh, have an open conversation with them, try figuring out whether they have an opening for an intern, try having a conversation with them, right? And then start making a, so that by the time you already graduate, you know which direction you want to go in, right? Because most students, once they graduate, they just land up taking a job in a firm just because they need to have a job. Right, not because they want to work there or because they like the work that's being done there or they, they have any kind of interest in the work that's being done. So start doing that right now. Start looking at things that interest you. Start looking at work that interests you. Start looking at, at that at, at, at uh, uh, 
architects that interest you and start making a list of that that and start applying for that so that's what what, what i would advise i think to build on that um, i think be honest with yourself uh, understand what your skill sets are understand what your strengths are uh, I think also understand that those evolve with time. Uh, so when I graduated from OSU, to be very honest with you, it did not prepare me for the real world today uh, from a standpoint of when I came back to India and I worked in architectural practice. But five years into my career, 10 years into my career, I now fall back to what I learned at OSU that's holding me in good stead today. So them, and I, I guess with millennials today as well, is that instant gratification of, I want this fixed now and I want it to happen now, it's not gonna happen in architecture. It's not that it's not like investment banking where I do a good deal and I earn a million dollars overnight. Uh, architecture is brutal. Architecture is painful. Architecture is something that you have to be passionate about to stick with it. Uh, and, and you're gonna have more downs than ups, but the, the, the lower number of ups that you have outweigh the number of downs that you have. And that is what you drive for and live for. Uh, and being happy with uh, spreading harmony, I guess, within and spreading harmony around you. Uh, because architecture is a very demanding uh, field and it takes everything out of you. Uh, but the satisfaction of seeing that structure built um, is the high that all of us thrive on every single day. Uh, it, and, and realizing that it takes one year, two years, and at times in India, four years and five years to realize that dream as long as you stay positive and focused, it will happen and stick with it. Don't give up. And also the context, right? Like even if you have learned certain things about architecture in a certain context, it completely changes once you are in a different location. You have to sort of unlearn what you learned before, even in terms of client management, because I feel like one of the biggest challenges, especially in architecture, if you're doing any client interfacing work is to learn the the rule of the land right like the lay of the land in in there is there is so much cultural nuance in in how feedback is communicated uh, in the west versus in the east there is so much to read in between the lines so i feel like that's also a, a skill that you kind of learn over time apart from the the core skill set that you're supposed to bring to the table the, Client interfacing is such a huge part of what we do, right? To convince people to buy into our ideas and to be able to do that in a way that um, that's acceptable in a certain culture. The moment you step into uh, a, a client, step into a meeting with a client in the Middle East, everything changes. The same, the way you pitch the the project changes. Um, so you, I, I feel like only experience teaches you that. So give anywhere in the world you, you want to work, you have to give it enough time to be able to understand that piece as well. Uh, not just, ju just the hard skills that you ought to have. True, and to add to what Prashant was uh, talking about earlier is uh, don't obsess about uh, liking a particular style or figuring out your own style so soon. Sometimes, uh, you might not find out what you really want or what you uh, what your design style is in four years of undergrad. You might need one or two years of work experience to figure that out or maybe more. And uh, it is also possible that each year your style and your preference changes. So that is also possible. You might work with firm A and you suddenly like the style and then you go to firm B, you, you prefer that style. So that can always happen. So don't obsess over it. But what you can do is what what I've noticed about the I don't know, I always, uh, our library was always empty. You know, the, the architecture library, I mean. It was like uh, very uh, rarely, if someone had to research about a particular project, then students would approach the library. And uh, let me tell you, when I was studying my undergrad, in my first year, our professor, uh, in fact, our principal, he was quite uh, involved in the students, uh, you know, design life and how they uh, deal with architecture. So he was personally involved. So he used to force us to like, no spare time, 
uh, can be you know wasted in the corridors he would say just go and sit in the library just go and sit in the library so even our breaks would be in the library so we were sort of forced to look at books that we didn't understand in the first year but slowly we got into the habit of surfing through various books we would just go through books and books tada and do and all sorts of architects you know around the world but that did is we actually started identifying projects that we really liked and when we uh, identify and actually tag those what what these students can actually do is go sit in the library just open a book you can you may not read much you can just surf through the picture but see what you like and if you like start tagging it in your notebook or maybe in a database that you make start uh, collecting pictures in specific folders of uh, different kinds of projects uh, if you do that what you might also realize is say in your fourth year you will see a lot of projects that you were uh, liking in the first year and uh, there were specific reasons why you liked those projects at that time and suddenly when you're you know in a rut how do uh, you say a writer's block or a designer's block when you're in a designer's block in say your fourth year suddenly when you just just browse through one of your you know databases you can actually come across something which you used to like which you know caught your attention and it was really nice at that time and you know maybe that inspires you to uh, get out of your block so that's what i that's a tip i would uh, recommend all the students to do have your own uh, you know architectural book of projects all kinds and categorize them keep it very neat and tidy i am obsessed so i make folders of every kind i make folders of housing i make folders of contemporary design i make folders of you know like i make specific folders for each of them so i think that tip would really work for you always go back down the lane uh, save your sketches like if you have uh, you know random sketches that you make on your sketchbook just take a picture save it in those folders as well so sometimes there are ideas that you get while just you know sitting idle then years later also if you revisit that idea it fascinates you and you can actually develop on that idea which is 10 years you know younger like it had a, a lesser experience lesser knowledge but still that idea was like really unique so you can actually go back to that i think that's a really really important uh, thing that many people, many students forget now they are very stuck to what's given to them okay i have to study uh, so and so architects one project uh, because mike has asked me to do that so i will study just that project you know like i will not study 10 different uh, projects unless required for me academically so that's that's what i would recommend to all the students Well, thank you all so much for the valuable input that you've given our students. I know I am walking away uh, from this conversation just feeling enlightened, um, not only uh, about uh, the possibility for our students, but I think also just the global reach that Ohio State has, um, whether it be our global gateways offices, the uh, international office in the College of Engineering and Dalton School of Architecture. Um, I, I hope our students. realize the resources that are at their fingertips here during their time um in Columbus but i just again want to say thank you so much to our alumni panel um all of you we i really appreciated this conversation nikhil and vinod from our india gateway office for helping coordinate and reach out to these wonderful alumni and i'm going to put in the chat here for our students that uh, as i said this is just the first of a series that we're having with conversations with architects around the globe. Uh next Wednesday we'll be having a similar conversation with um architects working in Brazil with our Brazil gateway. So we're we're hoping that you can join us again for a conversation next week. But again, thank you to our wonderful alumni panel here today. Uh we really appreciate this conversation and thank you so so much for giving us your your evening. Thank, thank you for you. having thank us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Also Aaron, I have a request. Thank you. Uh I would yes. very much uh, like to be a part of uh, like not a panelist but I would like to participate in one of those you know like for, for example Brazil I would like to know what's going on there so hear some of their experiences so if you send us the links as well that would be great I would be a participant on that uh, panel as well 
certainly, certainly, I can. I, I'd be happy send to, to send you those links. But that's, that's that's really nice because that allows for cross conversations to happen. You know, because we we get to know what's happening there. We get they get to know what's happening here, and we and everybody is sort of connected by the common thread of OSU. So that'd be really nice. Absolutely, I'll, I'll be sure to send that to you all. That'll be great. Thank you. And if anybody needs help in, in trying to come to India, like like Atita, Kayan, um, Mitika said, please get in touch with us. Uh, if there are recommendations you need for places that you want to go visit, if you need help, please reach out to us. We are very, very uh, happy to help anybody. So, uh, Nikhil and Minot, please feel free to share our information. Absolutely.